Rupert Soskin. And I'm Michael Bott. Welcome to another Prehistory Guys interview. Introducing you to people who are out there working hard to bring archaeology and prehistory to a wider audience. Yes, and today we're talking with Dr Tess Mackling, archaeologist and researcher working with museum replica maker Roland Williamson. She has a particular fascination for Iron Age Talks, running a website with Roland called The Big Book of Talks. And she's membership secretary to the Prehistory Society as well, and wait for it, a maker of replica artefacts in chocolate. Yeah, I, d I don't think we should make it quite the dominant thing. It would be easy to do so, have to say. <laughs> but um, have you seen any of uh, Tess's chocolate artefacts? <laughs> they're, they're, I have. They're completely insane. You would yeah. never know they weren't the genuine article. I mean, everything from flint arrowheads to copper axes and and all edible. I, I just I can't imagine bringing myself to eat one though. Uh, no, agreed. Mind you, they are made of chocolate. Um, yeah, but uh, moving on. Uh, <laughs> Tess has been membership secretary for the Prehistory Society for 25 years and is constantly active in bringing prehistory into the public domain. Yeah, notably, I have to say, as a leader in the Young Archaeologists Club, and personally, I can't think of anything more valuable than inspiring children in any field. How very true. She really is a powerhouse behind the scenes. She is. Should we get her on then? I think we better have. <laughs> Welcome, Tess. Welcome to the Prehistory Guys podcast. Great to have you with us. Thank you. It is. It's a treat to have you with us. It's and, fun uh, to be here. <laughs> yeah, or well, you wait. <laughs> <laughs> do you know what? The first question we always ask absolutely everybody, uh, because people do love to know, what was it that got you started in archaeology in the first place? What got me started in archaeology? Well, um, I think fossils is, and playing around in the garden, like so many of us. Um, and then I was doing various things with the Young Archaeologist Club, went on my first dig when I was 12, sliced my finger to the bone, which <laughs> didn't put me off, um, came back again, and then started digging in Sussex from that point on. And I'm however many years old now, and I've been doing it ever since. So, yeah. Yeah. So it was fossils that actually kicked you off then rather well, than... Well, that was kind of... Yeah, I grew up in Sussex. Artifacts. I grew up in Sussex, so chalk. There's lots yeah. of fossils in chalk. And then yeah. and then you gradually move on. I think That's so many I, people do. You start off with that and then get into archaeology. I, I, I remember being convinced I was going to find a brontosaurus in the, uh, yeah. in the garden if I dug down. <laughs> <laughs> These were kind of sea urchins and things like yeah. that. They weren't quite as big as a yeah. brontosaurus, oh, but oh, yeah. you probably actually got a result then, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. So, because um, you you mentioned the Young Archaeologists Club, yes. there. so so you actually kicked off with the Young Archaeologists. Club, yeah, I did. You? I was never a member of a club, but I used to get their newsletter from somewhere, and that was where I found the first dig that I went on. Mm. Um, after a lovely letter to Peter Druitt, bless him, who's gone now. Um, but yes, he was brilliant, and he said, "Oh yes, get out and dig and do stuff." and there's the Sussex Field Archaeology Unit, as was then, which is now a commercial unit. Um, yeah. And I went digging with them and never looked back and then worked for them. Yeah, yeah it's just was, was it's a really a good way to get into archaeology. Was there a yeah. standout moment that turned your head, that, that had you say to yourself, I'm going to do this forever and a day now? I don't know. I don't think I ever doubted that I wasn't yeah. going to. Um, I loved being outdoors. I'm not a nine to five office person. So it's suited in so many different ways. You get to be with lots of people of your own age. You get to go out and get muddy. You you know, you have fun. It's it's good. Yeah. And then you get to find great archaeology as well. I mean, I was yeah. always interested in history anyway. So yeah. it just kind of fell into all of it, I think. And what was your yeah. academic yeah. pathway then? You know? <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, I did. I did a degree at UCL, a general archaeology degree, which was a lot of field work. Um, yeah. Then ended up working as a field archaeologist for a few years. Then ended up doing medieval pottery, because they needed someone to look at some medieval pottery. Then got into prehistoric pottery. Then mm. bizarrely ended up working out in the Caribbean, um, as looking you do. at yeah. <laughs> Sorry to say. <laughs> well, there is a kind of pottery link there somewhere, but. Um, 
So, yeah, I ended up doing a PhD on 17th century fortifications in the Caribbean. Um, then had my daughter, took time off to look after her and then came back in again a few years ago. I mean, I've had the prehistoric society membership secretary job now for 25 years. So that's kind of seen me through all yeah. the different things yeah. I've done. Yeah. Um, but yes, now I'm back in the Iron Age again, looking at gold, which is not something most archaeologists get to do. It's great. I know. Is, and we'll have, a, yeah. we'll have a yeah. great conversation about gold uh, later yeah. on. <laughs> um, but uh, perfectly, because the next question I was going to ask you was about the prehistoric society and for yes. the last 25 years that you've been with them. Have you been membership secretary all that time? Or, I have. Or, uh, oh, I my have. goodness gracious me. It's amazing. Ever yeah. since I was a very young 20-something and terrified sitting in council rooms with all of the names off my bookshelf sitting before me so um but yes it's great it's it's great it's a fantastic organization um, how, how did that happen for you a friend said somebody's just left the job and they're looking for someone and i happened to be in london at the time yeah. um so yes i was interviewed and got mm. it and i've been doing it ever since so, so right place right time yeah yeah. Absolutely. I think so much of archaeology is about that. It's about networking and yeah. getting yeah. yourself known and talking yeah. to the people, you know. So, yeah. so for those that active, don't know, um, so for, for those that don't know, um, tell us ab about uh, the Prehistoric uh, Society because well, uh, yeah, we've got a lot of new folks here. That uh, Yeah, absolutely. No, it's a great organisation. Um, I mean, we go back. I think 1908 it started out as the Prehistoric Society of East Anglia and then became the Prehistoric Society in 1935. Um, we're basically a learned society, so and one of the four period societies. So you've got the Roman Society, Medieval Archaeology, Post Med Arc, and yeah. us. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and yeah, we produce a journal, we produce newsletters, we operate worldwide. Um, with a kind of leading organisation for prehistory, really. So with umbrella for a lot of other different things. Mm, mm. Mm. And uh, the and member. Sorry, Rupert. <laughs> no, I was going to say question. <laughs> we were. Yeah, that was it. So what what sort of size membership is the society now? Well, we've got about thirteen hundred individuals. Um, but the journal, the proceedings of the prehistoric society, goes out to just about every academic university <laughs> in the world. Um, yeah, go on, Mike. <laughs> and they've all got online access. So, uh, yeah. I d it's worth the membership for that alone. Hundreds oh, of thousands, I would think, yeah. have access yeah. to us. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it is, it's fantastic what you do, actually. Yeah, it is. It's a really good organisation. Really mm. good. Although it has to be said that your activity within the society, OK, <laughs> so you're, you're the, uh, the, the membership secretary, but you're very active in kind of putting things out in the public domain, aren't you? Or when I say mm. public domain, even if yeah. it's within the society. I mean, particularly, yeah. you know, your, your Facebook presence, for example. You're, yeah. uh, you're keeping that pot stirred very uh, vigorously, yes. aren't you? Yeah, I mean, we are, we're a charity and a company, and we very much see our role um, as not just towards our membership, but also towards prehistory in the wider world. Um, and for a lot of people, a more academic output doesn't suit, but they're still interested yeah. in prehistory. Also, you've got prehistory on the national curriculum now in primary yes. schools. Um, so we've always seen a really important part of what we do as being outreach. And the easiest way of doing that nowadays is social media. So as yeah. you know, we have an incredibly active Facebook group, which now has over 16,000 members. Yeah. Um, we've also got a Twitter presence. We've yes. produced online resources for schools and homeschooling, which in the current situation has just been fantastic. Yeah. Mm. Uh, in in a normal world, uh, you also put on uh, conferences. We uh, do. Yeah. Conferences, <laughs> lectures, events, site visits, yeah. which have all ground to a halt this year, but we'll be, be back next year. I yeah. don't think we've actually cancelled anything yet. Europa's being moved, which is our big annual conference. Yes. Yeah. Um, we're just just rerunning it next year so yeah. fingers crossed and you always get the most fantastic uh, speakers uh, we as do well. top, we absolutely do. yeah top I mean obviously notch. because we are the leading organization yeah. many of our council members are leading prehistorians many of our members are leading prehistorians and we can ask you know who we'd like to speak to us so we're yeah. very lucky in that way yeah, yeah. so um, what what would what are the 
let me give you an opportunity. Let us give you an opportunity <laughs> to, to sell the prehistoric society. You know, what, the benefits of, of, of membership, all that, you know, for people having a Well, lot. yes. I mean, it's we are one of the cheapest national, let alone regional organisations. So Not in the pejorative think, sense. <laughs> no, absolutely. No, just in the cash, in the cash way. <laughs> cash so, um, so, I mean, £35, <laughs> which is what it will cost you for a year, including yeah, yeah. postage and packing, will get you a copy of our journal, free access online to all back copies of the proceedings of the Prehistoric Society and the yeah. proceedings of the Prehistoric Society of East Anglia all the way back to 1908. You get three oh, newsletters heck. mailed out to you. Um, you get access to so many grants. Yeah. Um, we do various grants for travel, um, conference grants, yeah. research grants. Uh, I'm just trying to think what else. Lots of site visits. Like I say, we've been really lucky. We went to Must Farm three times when it was open. Um, we've been yeah. going every year to Avebury to see the excavations there um you'll also get loads of lectures in the evenings in london and across the country conferences day schools you name it we do it and all for 35 pounds that is <laughs> astonishing you know now yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, you've completely sold, sold it to me again <laughs> <laughs> it yeah. is ridiculous value for money it is. To be shut sure. up and it take is. my money <laughs> and for, stu for students it's even better because it's only 17 pounds 50 so you yeah. know <laughs> It's crazy yeah, value. It is. Yeah. It's fantastic. Yeah. 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 Well, anyway, listen, moving on, because otherwise the time will just pass us by and we won't get through half the stuff that we want to talk yeah. about. <laughs> yeah. uh, tell us about, because you do a lot of work with uh, um, with Ronald Williamson, don't you? The, Roland, uh, yeah. Roland, yes. Oh, did I say Roland? Oh, <laughs> God. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> that's um, okay. I'm sure I forgive you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do hope so. <laughs> um, but uh, because he he makes uh, museum replica artifacts, yes, doesn't he? And, yes. Uh, so d tell us a little bit about the work that you do uh, uh, alongside. Yeah, I mean, we've basically been working together for about five years. Um, and my side of things is more the kind of academic research, whereas Rolls is more. Um, Kind of how things were made he's got the very practical knowledge and experience um and together we started looking at talks which has been yes a bit of an odyssey i started mm. off at the beginning not knowing anything about talks and suddenly well, you know five what? years I, I, I'll, on I'll, I'll i'll stop you right there mm. so you yeah. tell people uh, to begin with explain what a talk is because so many people don't actually know uh, yeah i mean a talk the name actually comes from talk as in twist um so that's where it starts out and it used to be t-o-r-q-u-e um mm -hmm. as in the talk twist yeah. but now it's become t-o-r-c and basically they are neck rings um so in this country you get them from about the bronze age where you've got these beautiful gold neck rings of various varieties um, and then the ones we look at are Iron Age, and you can have very simple ones that are a single bar or two bars twisted together, or the ones that we are more focused on, which are more like the Snettersham Great Talk, which has the um, mm. twisted wires round in springs, yeah. which are yeah. then turned round more to make a rope yeah. with the terminals on the end. Yeah, yeah. I mean, to, to look at, you know, it's, it's a circle with a section cut out, basically. But often yeah. with decoration to the the, the ends. Uh, yes, of, they're know, like a C shape. They're basically yeah. a C shape. Yeah, yeah. But and you do also get ones that are a complete circle that have a kind of locking mechanism, so you can take a section out. Okay. Um, there's several from France like that. Okay. And uh, do, are they always sort of sized for for the neck, or can they be smaller for? No, they're. Yeah. You tend to get. Mostly they're sort of neck size, but you do yeah. get bracelet size ones, but we're not even sure if some of them were worn. They may have been put on ah. statues and things like that. Yeah, yeah. So with a lot of them, you do get wear along the areas which would have sat on the collarbone. So you've got a pretty good idea they were okay. worn. But then others, what they were doing in between the times when they were worn as well. <laughs> so they may have been worn sometimes and maybe put on a statue. Others maybe kept, we're not entirely sure. Yeah, so yeah. what's our understanding of them from a from a social point of view for example are they um are they for the the the, the rich the affluent the elite or are they more widely used than that well that's the question um i think it also depends on material because 
you get them in bronze. There's even a lead one from very late on from Northamptonshire, but bronze, silver, gold, the quality of the workmanship tends to change according to the material used. Mm. Um, and I think it's probably, we don't really know is the short answer, but I think mm. there's definitely a relationship. We're seeing a relationship between higher quality craftsmanship on better quality gold, yeah. which would suggest that there is some element of status or prestige. Mm. But whether that is individual status, community status, religious status, who knows? Mm -hmm. um, but there is definitely a gradation. It's like now you can have a ring that's a Ratner's ring or a Garrard's ring, you know, <laughs> yeah. 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 it doesn't yeah. make it less of a ring. Yes. Um, but who's buying these things, who's commissioning these things, we don't know. It could be communal, it could be individual. Well, and I was both? fascinated to read that uh, that some of them that have been found have uh, so rather than being solid and extremely expensive, they might have been hollow and even filled with wax to make them feel yeah weighty yeah. I mean that's so, that's one thing we've become very very interested in because there is definitely at, at the period in the Iron Age when these talks start appearing um, from about the fourth third century BC, there is a lack of gold in this country and. We're seeing, if you look at something like the Snettisham Great Talk, which has the huge terminals and the very thick neck, that's a kilogram of gold, which is a lot of gold. Wow. <laughs> but yeah. if you look at the Ipswich Talks, which are much thinner and have much smaller terminals, they are also a kilogram of gold. Oh. And if you look at the Snettisham Great Talk from a distance, it looks much bigger, much more gold. But what they've done is they've used all of these various techniques to kind of add space. So the hollow, the terminals are hollow, the neck ring is hollow and is made of all these springs, which obviously are hollow down the centre. Yeah. Um, so there is a real thing of more bang for your buck going on. And the absolute maximum of that is the tubular talks that yeah, you yeah. were talking about, which basically look like a... <laughs> an inner tube, I guess. <laughs> yeah. um, well, and they are packed with wax and an iron core. But the amount of gold in that is only about 110 grams, mm, mm. Right. which is the weight of a lemon wow. compared to the Snettisham <laughs> Great Talk, which is exactly yeah. the same size, but is 10 times that weight. So well, come yeah. back to the, the craftsmanship. Uh, where yeah. ge geographically, though, uh, have the fangs been uh, concentrated? Well, <laughs> The majority of talks from this country come from a site called Snettisham in East Anglia, which most people are very familiar with. And I think there's about 175 talks, the pieces of 175 talks from that site. Oh my um, goodness. Whereas for the rest of the UK, you're probably looking about, I don't know, less than 100 found in the whole of the rest of the UK. That's uh, amazing. What about oh, wow. Europe as a whole, though? Europe as a whole, we we like talks more than the rest of Europe. I think the last <laughs> count nice. that yeah. I saw for Europe is something like 350. It's all slightly changing because Snettisham hasn't yet been published and it keeps being reevaluated slightly as to how many there are there. But I think the overall total for the whole of Europe, including the UK, is only about 500 or so. Mm. Um, this is just for the Iron Age, obviously. Yeah, um, yeah. So we have a large proportion of them, and of that large proportion, most of those come from Snettisham. But yeah. Snettisham is doing something odd. Wow. It's not uh, typical. No. <laughs> I, I believe, though, that the, the first talk in this country was actually found in, in Scotland. Netherard. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. it's our favourite. It's our absolute, <laughs> yes. Yes, we're very fond of Netherard. Um, <laughs> little gold, it's a gold terminal from a talk that would have been basically the same so as So the, the terminal is the decorated end? The end, yeah. 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 Um, and all that survives of this talk is the terminal that was buried in the ground um, with three other twisted talks and mm. some coins from um, that would have originated in France. Um, unfortunately, as they did back then, back in 1806, I think I it was. I what you're going to say, yeah, go on. <laughs> yeah, they handed most of it to a goldsmith. <laughs> So oh. we have a couple of drawings. Yeah. Um, luckily, the terminal survived. The talk terminal survived. And a couple of the coins were kept as well. Um, 
but that that terminal is something really really special it's it's beautifully made it really is and because it's not attached to the neck ring mm. we can actually look inside it and see what's going on so it's been critical for our studies mm. Mm. didn't uh, you uh, didn't you overturn the conventional wisdom of how they were actually made in the first place yeah we did yeah, these particular ones, um, which all started because of the Newark talk, which was a, another talk found by detectorists in 2005 um, in Nottinghamshire. And Roland and I were talking one day and he just happened to say, look, I don't think they're made the way people have said they were. So I kind of had no knowledge at all about how they were supposed to be made. Did my usual academic thing and went and did a literature search to see what the evidence was. and. Although there were a lot of people saying these are cast and they're cast onto the wires, I couldn't find any actual evidence backing that up. So we started, it was one of those things where you just suddenly think, hmm, is this what I think it is? Let's go and have a look. And we did. Yeah. Um, and then found Netherurge, because as I say, we the Newark talk is complete, so you can't see inside it. Ah, yeah. um, whereas Netherurge, of course, we can actually have a look into the inside and that's where on everything you know i've got a bit of a reputation on twitter for asking people to show me the insides and the backsides of the things backsides. <laughs> that's, that's, yeah. show us your backside yes <laughs> yeah. um because that's where all the evidence of making is and that's how yeah. you tell how things are made and yeah roll got on the internet found netherard and said oh i've found there's this talk in scotland so yes we went off to the national museum of scotland and had a look and that changed everything because when we had a look inside it, you could see very, very clearly it wasn't cast. It was actually made of sheet gold. Yeah, um, right. And because of the similarities with the Great Talk, we could actually suggest that the Great Talk was also sheet work. Um, so we asked the British Museum to x-ray it. And sure enough, that was sheet, talk as well, uh, sheet work as well. Mm. Amazing, really. It reminds me of uh, a, a similar thing with uh, Bruce Bradley, the uh, amazing American yeah. archaeologist who said, it's amazing how so many academics can write papers on hunting when they've never even been out and shot a rabbit. Yeah, I think, <laughs> um, <laughs> and that's the thing I'm learning more and more now because I'm not, I mean, I come from quite a, a crafty, practical background. My dad was a carpenter and various other things, so... Um, I, but in I, talking I was just going to digress very, very slightly. Yeah. What, ab what about your great grandfather? <laughs> <laughs> the, the cycling one. <laughs> yes, him. him. Yeah, talking him. about craftsmanship. My, yeah, my. This is why also gold is important to me because my ancestry, my great grandfather was the last in a line of Huguenot goldsmiths and diamond setters that oh. go back to 1720s Huguenot France. Um, and that's the earliest we've got. I mean, they probably go back even further than that. Um, but yes, my great granddad was the last in the line of the Brio goldsmiths, as they were. Um, and he set, helped set the Cullinan diamond in the crown and the scepter. So, Amazing. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I, have, I do feel I have, like I'm continuing the family line a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> you, ought, you, you have to say about his cycling, though. Yeah, he was also a champion cyclist. <laughs> <laughs> and he held the world record for London to Brighton and back in something ridiculous like six hours, I think it was, on a tricycle often as well. Um, oh my goodness, and the, it's just incredible. I know, it? it is. He was, yeah, it was such a shame. He died in his early 30s. I'd love to have spoken oh, to him. He's someone who, oh, well, Lord. all of my ancestry, I'd have just been presenting them with yeah, bits of gold yeah. and saying, what's yeah. this? How did they make yeah, it? Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. A, a small diversion, <laughs> but an important one, I think. Yes, I'm, I'm yeah, glad we've gotten into that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it, it's amazing how uh, yes, how a little thing, how little threads can feed through families. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. But uh, aside from the talks, so um, uh, because obviously that's that's such a huge part of your work. Yes, isn't it really? Uh, but how do you see that? I mean, obviously you've specialised in that because you have a particular fascination mm. for it. But but from a from a social and cultural point of view in prehistory, how do you see them actually fitting there? You must have some sort of sense of what yeah. They're about. Mm. My feeling is they're communal um, because you don't on the continent you find them in graves not very often but you do find them in graves okay in this country you don't 
so we have all the incredible graves um, of East Yorkshire, the chariot burials, which have massive high status goods, all sorts of other things. They never include talks. Mm. Um, right. Now, it may well be to do with differences in burial practices, perhaps, but and we're also seeing a longevity to a lot of the talks that they are. Snettisham seems to be a one off event in the first century BC where they put all of these talks in the ground. Yeah. Probably the work we're doing at the moment is suggesting that they go in all at very similar time. Um, so it's not a co not occurring as a horde necessarily. No, no, no. This is uh, my feeling is this is some kind of deposition at once, which ends the culture of talks wow. in this country. Goodness. Um, okay. Yeah, this is something we're working on at the yeah, moment, yeah, but yeah. there do seem to be relationships between the hordes. Basically, you've got pieces of material in one horde that appear to have been taken from another hoard to be used, but that the whole lot has gone in the ground at the same time. Mm, mm. Um, but there's definitely cross links between various of the hordes. So it's not that one horde went in and then 20 years later, the next horde went in. Yeah. My, f I mean, as I say, it's very, it's very early stages, but our feeling is this happened very, very quickly. Mm. And it almost marked the end of that culture, mm. that the relevance of talks was no longer there for whatever mm, reason. Wow. Um, and the feeling of them being communally owned, or I don't know what the right word for it would be, um, is that we know that several of those talks are quite a few hundred years old before they go in the ground. Okay. So where have they been in that time? Um, mm -hmm. We're also working on something where we think that <laughs> we're working <laughs> with people who specialise in spring fatigue, would you believe? Um, well <laughs> Spring fatigue. Well, it it's all a makes metal sense. thing. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. So um, basically what we think, there's certain evidence from one of the talks at Snettisham that would suggest it's been opened and closed regularly. So presumably been taken on and off regularly, Yeah. but has yeah. then been rested for a significant amount of time. And then when it's reused again, it's broken. Oh, because of this nice. particular way that metal fatigue works. Yeah. Now, if that's the case, it does suggest that these things have a changing usage over time, that maybe they were going onto statues or they were going yeah. away into boxes. I don't, yeah. yeah, we're not sure at the moment. This is all kind of developing, but it's certainly not a straightforward picture of you have, you put your talk on for a ceremony, you take it off, it's yours. It, it seems to be much more complicated than that. Do you have a wow, sense okay. at all um, as to who would have worn it? I mean, you know, breaking it down, starting at, you know, top level, um, would uh, women have worn them predominantly? Well, or men? Or again, is it a split? Do we know? Again, there's all of these things. I mean, we've, we've got this record of Boudicca wearing this gold necklace. Now, how accurate the translation of that is and things like that, I can't really comment on. Um, yeah. I don't think there's anything to suggest that women weren't wearing them. We've obviously got elements of matriarchal society in Iron Age Britain. Mm. Um, equally, they, as I say, the very, very good ones, like the Snettisham Great Talk, Netherard, um, probably Newark, they are prestige items. They are made by the best goldsmiths. Yeah. Um, they are very complicated. The gold is very pure at a time when gold was a, a rare commodity. Yeah. That to me, even though we keep trying to get away from things of status and prestige, you can't <laughs> help looking that way. Now, whether that's yeah. monetary, I don't know. So it could be different how we see prestige nowadays. It might have been religious yeah. prestige or family prestige or... Um, I don't know is the answer. I think these things were definitely, they were definitely important. They definitely meant something. Gold at a time when you don't really have anything naturally shiny. You know, we're yeah. so surrounded by shiny things nowadays. We don't think about it. Yeah. Um, but back then. That's a fair point. <laughs> but it is, yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, you've got water and you've got the occasional mirrors back then and maybe a bit of glass. Mm. 
but shiny metal and particularly with gold because of the quality of it that something mm. like the great talk when it came out of the ground wouldn't have been tarnished wouldn't have been and that's what it would have looked like yeah. back then it would have been gold it would have been bright yeah. whoever had would have seen it would have been awed by it in the same way that we are now yeah. um yeah. and clearly it wasn't something that everybody had and the minute you have something that not everybody has you start looking at status and prestige and things yeah. like that but then again if it was owned by a community it could be a community prestige you know that this community was important because it had this talk yeah who knows i don't know clear I don't something think we've got the answers clear something up for me tess alongside mm. the great um snettersham talk yeah you've got the snettersham grotesque talk and the snettersham mini grotesque Talk. Yes. What's that about? <laughs> well, the grotesque talk, the poor grotesque talk, when it came out of the ground, it was known as the marriage talk because okay. it's got um, a loop of talk going through holding the terminals together and it was seen as maybe symbolic of some kind of joining, linking marriage. Mm -hmm. And then it, it seems to have picked up along the way this description of the grotesque talk because it's not as... It's something called plastic art, which is this very high relief, very modernistic almost nowadays looking um, style. So it then became the grotesque talk. And then when we found, because <laughs> <laughs> the trouble is all these things, we, we have to give these things names because yeah. then you know what you're talking about. Um, we actually call the mini grotesque Heinz 57 because <laughs> 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 it's a position. Of course you do. Yeah. <laughs> It's at position 57 on Norwich Castle's museum board, and it was kind of a bit of everything, so it was Heinz 57. Um, <laughs> but in papers, we called it the mini grotesque because it has a similar style of art to the grotesque talk. So okay. I'm so glad we cleared that up. Tess. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we also have the B-52 as well, which is another... <laughs> It means Ron and I know what we're talking about, rather than saying 1991.387, comma, you know, museum yeah. accession codes are a nightmare. Yeah. So, oh, yeah. yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Interesting. <laughs> Very Interesting. nice short so Outside of talks. Yeah. Outside of talks. Tell us about, uh, so you know, how do talks fit into the rest of your understanding of Iron Age Britain, particularly Iron Age? I know you go back further, but... Um... I'm not sure. That I, I will be completely honest with you at the moment, because... They gold seems to be so unique. What we're finding now is we're, we're even finding it's worked in a completely different way to other metals. Mm. So it's not even worked in the same way as bronze is. Um, we're also still ploughing through all of the talks. <laughs> it's quite a few of them. We've seen quite a lot of them now and we've got a pretty good understanding of most, but we haven't seen all of them. Um, yeah. And as did, I say, did we, this, did we mention the number that we have in this country? We've remember. got, I think, we in do. terms we of pieces, do. we're up to probably, with PAS fines and various other things, I would say it's probably about 100. Okay. Um, yeah, maybe less than that, 70-odd. Um, in terms of complete ones, I guess 30, 40. Mm. Um, but they're all slightly different techniques. At the moment, we're just looking at the Taurus talks, yeah. which are the ones with donut terminals, like the Snetch and Great yeah, talk, yeah. but we're gradually yeah. kind of going out from there as we're understanding those ones, we're then starting to look at other ones and see how they fit as well. Mm -hmm. But currently we don't really have a chronology for any of them because most of them are either antiquarian finds or they're detector finds, or even when they've been kind of excavated properly, you've got no other contextual information. You've just got oh. talks in the ground. Oh, I see. Oh, amazing. Um, oh, I so didn't we don't realize that. That is a yeah, problem, isn't it? Jeez. Yeah, it's very <laughs> tricky. So. And previously, everything has been down to art historical criteria. So this period of Celtic art dates to this phase. This yeah. one is later because, it, you know, but it's all a bit, we're not entirely happy with it. We don't think, <laughs> and the technology seems to be giving clues to suggest that actually things aren't quite the way again with that, that people have assumed that they were before, mm. because so often in this country, we've, found something different and then said, oh, that must have been imported from the continent. We couldn't do that kind of metalworking at that stage. Whereas we're finding that, yes, actually, we were quite capable of doing metalworking of that skill at that stage. Yeah. 
Um, and it also tends to happen from north to south. So Netherard has always been assumed of being an import from East Anglia because ah. Scotland couldn't do this stuff right. in inverted commas. <laughs> really? Yeah. yeah, whereas we are seeing more and more, you've got certain types of very specific Scottish finds, um, like these what's called massive arm rings, um, mm. and also ribbon talks that are actually occurring in Cambridgeshire, East Anglia. Mm. So mm. there is obviously trade going from Scotland yeah. south, and yeah, we, yeah. we've always wondered whether the talks are a north and west phenomenon, because that's where the gold is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Interesting. So, am, yeah. am, I, am I right in thinking that the Vikings come along and uh, complicate <laughs> matters a bit? <laughs> well, this is, yeah, this is, <laughs> the Newark talk was found, as I say, near Newark, which is um, on a river crossing. Mm. Um, it was found in quite unusual circumstances because it was found on its own, which, although that's not unheard of, normally talks are found in groups of kind of three or four. What's also really unusual about the Newark talk is that it has this rather large cut in it, um, which was always assumed to be kind of plough damage, something like that. Mm -hmm. When we had a really close look at it, you can see that actually it's been done with a very sharp blade. The knife has gone in and then yeah. it's been opened. So oh, you've got a kind of open cut. Yeah, yeah. Um, where you see this most often is something called Viking nicking, where they do it on all kinds of things, ingots, jewellery, you name it. Initially, it's thought to test purity. So you put a nick in it to check, is it 100% gold or is it something that's been gilded to look like gold? Mm, yeah. um, but there also seems to be a ritual element. So you have these bar ingots, which have got about 40, 50 nicks in it. It may be yeah. something to do with trading that as you pass it on, you nick it and it's part of the process. But anyway, this talk has a nick in it. And then when we started looking, there's another talk from further north at a place called Caster. Caster, I'm hoping I'm saying it right. Um, which... Oh, you're in the right place for pronunciation. <laughs> pronunciation. Yeah. <laughs> we love it. It's in northeast England, so yeah, in Lincolnshire. Um, but this also has a nick in it. And then when we looked a little bit further north, there were two, again, these ones are actually more bracelet sized um, talks one of which appears to have a nick in it also. And when you look at where these were actually found, they follow the route of the great Viking army. Um, oh. So <sighs> there's a possibility, we haven't had a look, we've obviously seen Newark very, very closely, um, yeah. and it's definitely not your standard kind of post-depositional damage on it. Yeah, yeah. We've seen the photos mm -hmm. of the damage on the other two talks but we've yet to go and see them which will make a bit more sense but we are wondering whether there was originally a horde with all of those talks in up towards york somewhere around the yeah. york way yeah. and then as they've come down the ooze um they've been kind of depositing talks as they go it wouldn't be unheard of um yeah it's interesting it's really interesting. There's a lot of evidence. Matt Knight, um, Dot Borton and Rachel Wilkinson have just oh. produced a book called Past in the Past, yeah. which is talking about how in history and prehistory people were reusing old objects. Um, I don't think there's a problem with that. And if I think the Vikings came across a hoard yeah. of gold... They wouldn't have said, oh, that's Iron Age, we can't play with it. So, um, yeah, absolutely. I don't know. More research needed, but yeah, it's yeah, a really yeah. interesting idea. It's still very much an idea at the moment, but. Thank you so much. Uh, I think that's, that's uh, opened a few uh, eyes and minds to uh, the possibilities and the depth that there is to yeah. go into. It's, with, yeah. It's just extraordinary that something so uh, clearly important can uh, you know that there can be such a small amount of information about them yes. one so. last uh, last question uh, around mm. talks to, to just finish that off is that artifacts like this you don't get a full impression of them unless you see them in the flesh i mean uh, rupert and i can speak to that first time we saw the bash bush, bash buried the, <laughs> the bush barrow, the bush barrow. Yeah. Uh, lozenge uh, from yeah. stonehenge environs uh and so where would you direct people to look at a decent um talk or two 
uh, in a museum up and down Ooh. the country. Yeah. Well, I mean, Newark, the National Civil War Museum in Newark is okay. fantastic. Um, you can have a good look at the Newark talk there. And they've also got some wonderful 17th century stuff, which, of course, I wouldn't be interested in at all. But yeah, <laughs> <laughs> no, Newark is well worth a visit. Um, National Museum of Scotland to go and find Netherard. And also they've got the wonderful Blair Drummond um, Sterling Horde, wow. which is the okay. four gold talks. They're beautiful. Yeah. Um, and the British Museum, obviously, for Snettisham and Clevedon yeah. Museum. I'm thinking okay. of more now, Clevedon Museum as well. Great. Oh well, yes. I'll put, put uh, those well, in. Uh, and must. your website, of course. There's some wonderful photographs. Oh, sure. on, <laughs> yeah. on, on, I'll, I'll put a. Website. I'll put a link. <laughs> yeah, yes, the, the big book of the talks. big book of talks. <laughs> yes, yes. And of course, the other thing linking up with what Roland does, the beautiful thing about replicas is, is that you can pick them up. You can hold them. You can feel the weight of what it would have been like. Um, Roll actually made a replica of the Southwest Norfolk talk for um, Norwich Castle Museum. And we took that to the um, Europa we had a couple of years ago in honour of Peter Wells up in Edinburgh. And everyone was putting it on because you can really feel what they feel like then. And yeah. they're bizarre because you don't, the first time you pick up a talk, you think it's going to be very still, very static. And actually they're really springy. Oh, and it's I quite see. frighteningly springy. <laughs> In oh that they want goodness. to bash the ends together the whole time. You spend your whole time trying not to kind of damage this incredibly precious artifact. Yeah. So yes, it's wow. only only if you get to hold them you really get a sense. And also yeah. the weight of gold as well. It's yeah. very difficult to comprehend because it's more dense than lead. Yeah. So it's yeah. heavier than lead. Mm. Um, so you pick up something like the Great Talk. It really is. You know you've got it in your hands. Yeah. Yeah. So talking of repli well, replica talks, uh, we, 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 <laughs> we hear that uh, there's a couple of lunatics uh, making them out of chocolate. What's that about? Yes. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yes, this started off, again, this is linked to Newark. I think this is when we were trying to work out how we could get some money to make a replica um, of the Newark talk. Um, and one of the ideas was we'll make chocolate talks and sell them in the gift shop. Um, yeah. And that then led to, yes, I can't... Yes, you can buy modelling putty on the internet that's food safe. And of course, working with a replica maker who has lots of things that it doesn't matter if I cover them with moulding putty. So yeah, I started, yes, <laughs> started making artifacts out of chocolate. Um, and there's yeah. only two rules. It has to be 100% edible and there yeah. has to be no internal structures to it. So I can't kind of put chocolate over something metal to give it a scaffold, as it were. Yeah. Um, I'll do my yeah. best to um, give folks a, a visual indication. Uh, <laughs> in, uh, yeah, we, we because have we're to. not I just talking about chocolate-coloured talks here. Mm. We're talking about uh, really, uh, as far as possible, breathtaking. Yeah. What you are making out of chocolate. <laughs> oh, thank I you. I couldn't. <laughs> I couldn't believe it when I first saw them. I thought. How could you actually bring yourself to eat them apart from anything else? Yeah, yeah I got, don't. You, <laughs> no. <laughs> I think I'd force myself. But um, <laughs> but even, I mean, for people who haven't seen them yet, you know, you, you've got uh, copper axes, flint arrowheads, uh, you know, worked flints, all that kind of stuff. That, But they just... They look like the actual <laughs> artefact. They don't look like chocolate at all. Yeah. It's an extraordinary piece of work. They uh, have fooled a couple of people, actually, that have actually thought, particularly the socketed, there's an Armorican axe that I made. Yes. That mm. did fool a couple of people. Um, yes, I, I keep threatening various <laughs> museums that they'll come back and find that their talk is now a chocolate talk rather than... <laughs> <laughs> Yes, come back into the museum in the morning and it's just a puddle of chocolate. Ah, oh, no, you see, atmosphere-controlled cases, it would be fine. Perfect. <laughs> it's about the one place you can get away with it. <laughs> it's an extraordinary thing to do. So, I mean, but do you, do you do these on commission? Can people buy a chocolate no, or something I've, or other? Or do you? No, I've made a couple for friends because, obviously, although I'm very careful... If you start going into things commercially, you need clean kitchens, you need hygiene yeah. certificates, all yeah. of that sort of thing. And it, for me, it's always been about the challenge. Um, so it's more about can I actually do it? Um, yes. That's always been the thing. And quite often, if I've made one once or twice and perfected it, 
I won't really make it again. Mm. Um, I mean, we have done we have done workshops in the past, um, Roland and I, where he talks about replicas. <laughs> Actually, it's quite good fun. He talks about replicas. I bring along a load of chocolate, and for the last hour or so, everyone sits around, has a glass of wine, and paints something. So, yeah, <laughs> takes away Thank their own hand axe or whatever. Is, is, is it is it the butler's brooch? Oh the, yes, Mrs. The, Getty's brooch, the butler's field brooch. Um, is just to look at that, you would not in a million years imagine that it was chocolate. It's yeah. just extraordinary. No, that yeah. one was um, because Roll actually carved out of um, it's an epoxy resin, and he carved because he needs a base for casting something. So he quite often carves a model, which can he can then mould from to then cast, you know, what would effectively be a complete accurate copy of something sure. yeah. um so i borrowed the model from him and covered it in modeling putty and then filled it with chocolate um but yes mrs getty's brooch is a nice one and there's a viking antler comb as well that i did that was oh, oh yes absolutely yeah. impossible <laughs> yeah, yeah but i did it so yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, well, do you know, I mean, apart from the fun side of that, one of the other things I wanted to ask you about, because as far as I'm concerned, it's actually the most important thing that any of us can do, mm. really. And that's your work with kids. You do yes. a lot of educating your kids, don't you? And yeah. I think, you know, if we can inspire children these days into, you know, any of these fields, then it's it's a wonderful thing. So, yeah, yeah tell us about what you do there. Well, I'm actually a, a leader for the Young Archaeologist Club. Um mm. Because like you say, I remember when I was, you know, when I first started, when I was 12, there were an awful lot of archaeologists put up with my letters of me saying, I want to do this. How can I do this? And wrote me back these lovely letters saying, well, have you thought about this? Have you tried that? Yeah. There was a lot of mentoring along my way. Um, and it's nice to offer something back, particularly now because I was educated at UCL. I was on a full grant. You know, I came from a family where nobody had really gone to university before. Yeah. Those opportunities aren't there for so many people now. Um, and particularly with the kids, I love it because I also work in schools um, teaching them about prehistory. And we've got a fantastic museum in St Albans who has just been brilliant. Um, and they will lend me their handling collection. Um, and we'll help out in various events and things like that. So, but it is where the next generation is. Um, mm. If we don't work with the children and inspire them and make them realise, because so many children don't think it's for them. Mm. That's why I yeah. particularly like working in schools because yeah. you have children from all kinds of backgrounds who would never even think of archaeology. It's mm. just not yeah. on their mental map. Yeah, yeah. Um, but you can really inspire them again replicas reenactment and things like that come into that as well um because roland does a lot of work doing viking things and saxon reenactment yeah. and when the kids see somebody dressed up as a yeah. saxon haskal or a viking with all the gear and swords and shields and you know the pots for making things and all sorts of other stuff it, it just fires their imagination it's so important yeah. Really Fantastic, is. yeah. I, it's great. I hadn't realised, you know, the prehistory was uh, on the on the curriculum. How long has that been? Uh, Since 2014. It's been right. there I'm six Way behind years the times now. I am. That's yeah. fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> so year yeah. three and four, what are they, eight, nine? Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, they, do, they start doing prehistory and they yeah. love it. They're yeah. really good at it. Yeah, yeah. cool. That's so nice, actually. That that's the, the, that really is a thing, so that we can actually be bringing kids up not mm. to imagine our ancestors as just still lumbering around Absolutely. wearing bear skins. Yeah. yeah, I mean that's part of the reason. Going back to the prehistoric society, that was why we developed the school resources blog that we've launched a few weeks ago, um, because so many teachers were saying we don't know what we're doing with this. You know, we we know the Victorians, we know the Saxons we don't really know where we're going with prehistory. Mm. So that was a, yeah. a large impetus behind us creating these resources. Yeah. Um, because it is more intangible, you know, it's it's yeah. much easier to say, <laughs> this yeah. is a Saxon, this is a Victorian person, this is, you yeah, know, sure. Tudors. Uh, absolutely, um, but ha having having read, you know, a few of your communications and, and, and blog posts, can I say how brilliantly you, you communicate to your audience? Oh, thank you. you know, really. <laughs> 
<laughs> really readable and you know uh, you, you yeah. keep a story going and keep uh, the, the interest there and you, you yeah, point out what's going on. I mean that's yeah. part of the reason why we wanted to start the big book of talks mm -hmm. because we are peer review academic publishing that sits underneath everything we're yeah. doing so it has to be proven with evidence um, and peer review but we also wanted a way for people who are outside of academia who haven't got access to the journals mm. and also just something that was current so if we because like i say we're working on so many different things mm. and mm. that whole thing with the viking nick talks there's not enough evidence there yet to do something heavily peer-reviewed yeah. on it yeah. um but there's enough to just put it out there and say this is an interesting idea and then if somebody else comes up with something, they can see that we're thinking about it as well. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it's, it's and also images. It means we can use lots and lots of images, which is lovely. It's, mm. it, particularly <laughs> with something like artifacts, you mm. need to have lots and lots of images. Mm, and the current yeah. restrictions of journal publishing, I understand why, because it costs them. You know, it's working for the Prehistoric Society. I know that the journal is the biggest thing we do, and it, it yeah. does have a cost implication. Yeah. Um, so yes, it's but the website has allowed us really just to write the way we want to write. I think occasionally, which is good fun. <laughs> Tess, yeah. it's been yeah. an absolute delight talking to you uh, this afternoon, as we have. Um, uh, we've enjoyed I have to ourselves. Ask you, uh, before we before yeah. we disappear, though, um, that it, it almost seems like a stupid question to say what's next because <laughs> you already do so much just ongoing mm. stuff. You know that you're just keeping on. Uh, producing stuff but have you got any uh, um, shifts of impetus uh, in the foreseeable future or uh, Ooh, that's a tricky one not? I mean we <laughs> tend to, we tend to go where the research takes us that's the beauty of being independent researchers that you yes. can suddenly think right this is an avenue we want to explore um, we've got a lot more talks we want to see because <laughs> <the Yeah>. <laughs> at the moment we're still categorizing them we're at the basic level really the grand theories are yet to come mm. um so yes see more talks do more i think i think the angle that we'd like to develop a lot more because we work um with an incredible team of goldsmiths and silversmiths um very very talented and i think we'd like to have a bit more of a go of experimental stuff to see yeah. I, I use the word experimental replication. It's not an experiment. These guys know what they're doing. There's no experiment yeah. about it. But just to see um, what we can produce, how quickly we can produce it, and just learn a bit more about the talks, really, I think. That's a plan. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Fingers <Fantastic>. crossed. <laughs> Tess, thank well, you so just, much. Uh, indeed. Indeed, it's been well, a it's been a treat, mm. and uh, and well, hopefully, um, you know, when <laughs> when all the lockdown and everything else has passed, and things get back to, uh, um, I won't say normality because I'm not sure that any of us really yeah. want that. But when <laughs> but when we you know when we're back to uh, uh, our work being able to move forwards again, then we very much look forward to seeing you. Yes, yeah. At, uh, <laughs> at conferences, at the next and event. Like, yes, so. yeah, yeah, well, yeah. yeah. Fingers crossed. End of October, we should be having a lecture, but. We shall see. We shall see. Yeah, we shall we see. may have to go yeah. online instead. So. In the meantime, I'm sure our listeners will have really enjoyed this. You know, it's, a, it's a, probably a, yeah. an avenue that no, not many people have, uh, have pursued, <laughs> and to have this chocolate and little, gold, little yeah. bit of an eye opener as uh, really and gold, really nice. Yeah, yeah. And teaching kids. It's yeah. Good work that you do. Thank yeah. you. Thanks ever so much, Tess. Thanks yeah. for having me. And Thank thanks you. to you, folks, for listening Pleasure. too. All right. Yeah. Bye bye. Cheerio. Bye. bye. Thank you for watching this Prehistory Guys show. There's loads more to watch, and you can get to some of it on this playlist here. If you'd like to receive updates about when we publish new content, hit the subscribe button, and you can unlock even more content by becoming a Patreon supporter. Hit this button here to find out more about that. See you soon.